All right, so it is noon and we're gonna go ahead and get started. Our session today, this is our first session uh, for our year four funding, uh, Lunch, Listen and Learn. We've got some really great new resources uh, to share with you today and um, to help you for, for this school year and beyond. We have some really terrific um, guests with us today. My name is Kelsey Schmitz. I use she, her pronouns, and I work for the University of Washington at the SMART Center, the School Mental Health Assessment Research and Training Center, uh, or the SMART Center, again, as we refer to it. I'm the uh, School Mental Health Director for the Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, and our center is located in Seattle. So we want to start uh, with our land acknowledgement. The University of Washington Smart Center and the Northwest MHTTC acknowledge that we learn, live, and work on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people who walked here before us and those who still walk here. We are grateful to respectfully live and work on these lands with the Coast Salish and Native people who call this home. And uh, we encourage you all uh, to use this uh, resource or other resources you have to learn more about uh, the lands that you live, work, and learn on. So for anybody who's new to us, uh, uh, and for those of us who've been with us before, this might be your chance to, to refill your drink, um, your, your water, your coffee, your tea, whatever you have with you. Uh, so we are part of the Northwest or the National Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, and this was funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Association in late 2018. Uh, the MHTTC is uh, the network includes 10 regional centers, a National American Indian and Alaska Native Center and a National Hispanic and Latino Center and a network coordinating office. Uh, each of the 10 regional centers also houses a school mental health team. And so that's uh, who we are and who you'll be spending your time with today. We know that uh, many of you are joining us outside of our region, um, which is great. And we hope that uh, you know that you have a school mental health center in your region uh, that you can tap into uh, for additional local resources and support. So again, as part of that national MHTTC network, our Northwest School Mental Health Team supports the mental health workforce in Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. And we encourage you to reach out to us. Um, we have just a wealth of information and resources on our website. Um, we have a newsletter uh, listserv that we send frequent announcements and new resources to. You can. Um, sign up for that. There's a link in the chat um, and we just welcome you to engage with us um, visit our social media pages um, and we look forward to getting, getting to know you and helping support your school mental health needs. So as a SAMHSA funded um, uh, entity, uh, we need to let you know that while SAMHSA sponsors this work, um, they uh, do not uh, reflect any official position in this content. All right, so as we get started, I just want to share with you um, a really uh, meaningful uh, tweet that came from our new sec Secretary of Education, uh, Miguel Cardona. I hope as you listen to the information presented today, you can reflect on ways to embed mental health um, into your school and district. Um, so he uh, reminds us that in the past, student access to structured mental health services in schools hasn't been implemented in a functional way. It's been ancillary and after the fact. We have an opportunity now to redesign schools and make sure that mental health services are a core part of a school's DNA. So I am really pleased to welcome um, our panelists today, uh, Dr. Kira Masseth, who's um, from the uh, Washington State Department of Health, uh, Corbett Mosley, who's joining us um, from the Pacific Mountain Workforce Development Council, Catrice Tybet Chapin, who's a school psychologist in Vancouver Public Schools in Washington. Um, I will be sharing some information with you, and then we'll introduce you to um, our newest uh, MHTTC staff, Rayanne Silva, who will also be sharing some things. So we're excited um, to spend uh, the next 80 minutes or so with you. And at this point, I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Masseth. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. I'm happy to be here. 
Um, I am here to share with you some, what I think is pretty um, interesting info about conceptualizing the COVID and the pandemic experience um, in the context of a disaster in ways that can help support kids and youth and students as they come back into sort of that K through 12 and even beyond um, into that learning kind of an environment. So I'm hoping that you will find something helpful in what I'm sharing with you today. I am gonna have to jump off um, as soon as I'm done with my part. So if there are questions that you have for me, I'm happy to follow up on those with email later on. Um, but both of my kids are home because yesterday, my five-year-old after his, it was on his first day of kindergarten, he was exposed to a positive case. So both of my kids are home now for 14 days in quarantine. And um, Kelsey and I were speaking right before with all the panelists, and this is just part of the part of the experience right now. And it's maybe not one of the funnest parts, um, but if we get interrupted by a three or five-year-old, you'll know why. And that's just kind of the context of what we're living in right now. So Without any further ado, I will move on. I'm gonna talk about how disasters impact behavioral health in general to give you some landscape. I'm gonna talk about specific considerations for classroom experiences, how we can actively build resilience, and then some techniques for de-escalation, good communication strategies that are really um, evidence-based and around data for what we know works in these contexts. Um, what I'm really here to talk about today and share with you is this, this document. We call it the Think Toolbox. Um, myself and two other members of the Behavioral Health Strike Team who work with the Department of Health in Washington have authored this kit that's available for teachers, parents, caregivers, and um, coaches, mentors, people who are just involved with the lives of supporting uh, those students in K-12 through situations. And like I mentioned, even beyond that, I also teach at Seattle U. And I think some of the things in here are just relevant for classroom instruction as we move into fall as well. So I'm hoping that you can access it. The link is right there in the slides. The slides will be available to you. They're also, the link is on the, um, in the chat, has been added to the chat. So please distribute and share that widely. It's a document that my team and I are very proud of and we hope that there are a lot of practical tips in there for folks. Okay, so the things that influence how people are feeling right now are very, very detailed and complicated. And there are really three levels. And that's important contextually to understand where your families and your own experience might be, but also that of your students. So there, the, th the first level is what folks came into the disaster with. Those are the underlying cultural um, and social factors that existed before the pandemic. And they include things like marginalization, discrimination, and racism. The second level includes the primary impacts of COVID. So that is, you know, did, did you get sick? Did you lose a loved one? Did you have someone in your family who was hospitalized? The direct impacts. And, you know, with the rates being what they are, that's affecting more and more people right now. The third level are things that are what we call secondary COVID impacts. And those are all the other nuances, the sociopolitical things, the educational pieces, and some of the economic pieces. So each family's and each community's individual experience of recovery and moving through this pandemic is based on their combination of all of those factors. And it gets complicated pretty quickly. Okay, so the factors that I was just listing can predict to a certain extent where someone may be on this chart. What this picture represents is the behavioral health pattern of response that humans go through whenever we are exposed to a disaster or a critical incident. This one specifically has been adjusted for COVID, but the general pattern remains the same regardless of the type of disaster that it is. Usually people have questions about that. Um, I don't want to spend a ton of time on it, but the idea is that a pandemic is classified as a natural disaster. And we have been studying disasters for decades, so we know a lot about how people kind of respond in terms of patterns. And, and the pandemic really is not any different except for the timeline for when it started in your area, right? So Minnesota is in a different spot than Florida, is in a different spot than New York or California or than Washington state. Every like area had a different progression and a different timeline, but this pattern, how it represents behavioral health symptoms, especially those of anxiety and depression has been consistent throughout. So the lower you are on this scale, the, the more symptoms there tend to be. For Washington state, the hardest part was so far has been um, over the late fall and winter and sort of early, 2021 months. So from October through February last year into this year, that was what we call the disillusionment phase. And now we're headed into what we what, what is called in disaster science, the reconstruction phase. However, many, many folks in our communities are experiencing what we call a disaster cascade. 
And that is certainly something that's gonna show up for students this year in the classroom. It is hard to argue, I think, that the Delta variant and the fifth wave, at least that we've experienced in Washington, hasn't caused a disaster cascade for most people. So what has happened as a result of that is that you have people transitioning from this typical response pattern that you see in the solid yellow line to the dotted line. And what that means just is that their, their recovery process is going to take a little bit longer and be a little bit more challenging. But, I, and I can say this unequivocally, the most common outcome in all disasters is resilience. And that is what we wanna advocate. That's what we wanna not overwhelm ourselves by trying to do, but that's what we wanna keep in the back of our mind always as we work with difficult challenges and, and kids who really need some extra support is that resilience still tends to be the most common outcome at the end of the day. And we'll get there. It's just a longer road than we ever anticipated when this started. Okay, so a couple key things to know. Um, I'm not gonna read these slides to you and I have a lot of information to share, so I'm gonna move fairly quickly, but please remember that you will have access to the slides later. The bottom line with this one is that there are complicated things that are playing out in how kids are returning to school. And students in the classroom primarily are gonna be having concerns. I would say that the, high, the, the primary level of concern that you're gonna see are around behavioral interactions. There is a lot of trauma that people have experienced and a lot of stress. And stress and trauma, although they're not the same thing, they are neurologically related to each other. So for example, um, all trauma is stressful, right? But not all stress is traumatic. All of us have experienced stress and kids too. And they tend to be an underdiagnosed and under like acknowledged group in the population who has really struggled and suffered throughout this time. So there are lots of features in terms of how parents are being affected that and in, in their ability to support kids too, that have influenced the behavioral health um, aspects of how people are doing right now. Uh, someone just asked in the Q&A, please define resilience. I, 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 that's coming, but I'll just, I'll do it right now. Um, resilience is made up of four key features based on research. Um, it's defined as a combination of purpose, connection, adaptability, and hope. Those are the four ingredients of resilience. And I am gonna come back to that, but that's a good baseline to set right now. Okay, so other key things to know is that clearly the impacts of the pandemic aren't experienced equally. So folks in marginalized communities and those who have come into this pandemic with fewer access to resources um, and have experienced discrimination and racism are clearly having, I mean, the, the numbers are, are very clear in terms of the behavioral health impacts on those groups are, te they tend to be stronger and they tend to be more negative. And that's something that as we, as we come back together in classrooms and in social settings, it's helpful to be mindful of. So the primary thing that's happening neurologically with, with students and youth and adults like across the age spectrum is that because the brain is so exhausted from working through this disaster, there are two primary areas that are affected, the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex. And this, this influences everything. It influences how we perceive information, how we behave, how we communicate, and how impulsive we are in our choices. So the limbic system, which is responsible for the emotional processing, tries to perceive our environment and then to activate our body in order to keep us safe. So when we perceive a threat, our limbic system says, run, hide, fight, whatever it does. It helps you release adrenaline and it, and it is the part of the brain that's responsible for anger, fear, happiness, all of that stuff. The prefrontal cortex is the part that we need for thinking, learning, and focusing. And to be very frank with all of you, most adults at least in the United States right now feel like they have symptoms related to ADHD or they're worried they may have early onset dementia. This is very, very common in disasters. Um, you can't focus, you don't know what you went into the kitchen for, you get distracted, you can't remember if you sent that email. Our brains are kind of all over the place. And that's a function of how long this has been, how tired we are in managing all of this stress, and how active our limbic system has been. So what you may see playing out in the classroom are students who are making impulsive decisions and emotionally based decisions because their brains aren't integrating. Adults are doing it too, right? But the idea here is that if we can slow down even just a beat before we respond to something, it helps the parts of the brain integrate with each other in order to make a more, um, I would say more efficient, more accurate and a potentially more helpful decision around what needs to happen next, whether that's words or actions or whatever it is. Allowing more time and pausing 
before we respond and encouraging students to do that too will help with this neurological uh, challenge that we're facing. Okay, so these three circles just represent common responses. And it's really, really uh, common also to have all three of these experiences even before lunch on any given day. So you can think, oh, this is gonna be great. And then I'm really worried about this. And then like, oh, I'm not sure how I feel within the same hour or day or frequently moving back and forth. So other things that I'm hearing from folks, and this applies to students as well, um, there's a lot of anxiety about participation. There's a lot of, oh, should I go, should I not go? Uh, is it safe, is it not safe? And if I do go, what if I get immediately overwhelmed? Or the idea of this thing is very overwhelming. Two takeaway points here. Number one is that there is no playbook. None of us have ever lived through anything like this before. So really encouraging people to recognize that we're all sorting it out together. And even though someone may act like I have the answers, I know what the rules here are, there aren't any. And we each deserve the opportunity to set those boundaries and those guidelines for ourselves as we make choices moving forward. The second takeaway point here is that it is very helpful for adults and youth alike to have a backup plan whenever you're making a commitment to go do something. And so for, I'm just gonna throw out an example. You go to a family reunion, you show up, there's 50 people when you thought there was gonna be 20 and you feel instantly overwhelmed, but you don't have a ride or a backup plan. In that situation, you may be more likely to do something impulsive because of where we all are neurologically, and it's gonna have a more negative effect on your behavioral health. So taking a moment to create a backup plan, um, whether that's at school or work or for social things or whatever, is likely to be beneficial to people. Okay. So this is just a list of some of the common responses that you may see in, in classrooms moving forward into the fall and winter months. These, these things we know are common responses for children and youth to disasters in general. So emotional um, intensity and cognitive difficulties, kids are gonna need to learn in very physical ways. There is so, so much research on education and emergencies. And I would strongly encourage many of you who are doing this directly to look into that body of, body of work but most of it is about physically getting children up and moving in order to help neurological integration, because that allows the prefrontal cortex to retain and process information and actually keep it. Um, if kids are just sitting and they're not as physically active, the brain has less of an opportunity to integrate and is less likely to remember effectively. So those cognitive challenges are going to be something that we need to consider in our curriculum planning and in our classroom management as well. It is also very common for kids to experience regression in behavior, whether that is physically, whether that is behaviorally, acting out, um, reliving things, acting in a way that's much younger than their, than their biological age, uh, and in losing milestones. That's a, that's a common thing that uh, teachers and other caregivers may be seeing. Okay, so I wanna move forward and talk about communication. Um, communication, whether it's in the classroom setting or at home, is a key, uh, sort of an issue that is, is worth addressing on a behavioral health level because it affects all of the things that we do. So when we're stressed, uh, we tend to have too much cortisol happening in our bloodstream. And we also sometimes tend to release adrenaline. We tend to react very strongly to things. So when people are emotionally flooded, what that means is that there tends to be adrenaline in the brain happening. And it tends to be the limbic system that is in charge of the communication that is not likely to be very productive. When people are emotionally flooded, the prefrontal cortex, even though it's still physically there, it is not part of that integrated process. So people are responding emotionally and not as cognitively. You're less able just on a very neurological level to think clearly. What we wanna point out is that when, when students are in their best place for learning and adults, right, is in that green zone on this chart. Green is when we're focused, when our brains are integrated. We frequently aren't there. When we are in the red zone, it is a function of time and space to get from red to green. It takes about 30 minutes for the body to reabsorb adrenaline that has been released. And so when, when someone's really upset and angry, it's time and space is, the, is part of the antidote for that. Blue and yellow can be brought into green. You can, you can transition from blue and yellow to green using physical movement. That's the easiest, most effective way to do it. That means getting people to stand up, physically move both arms and legs. It's called bilateral stimulation. So when you stimulate both halves of the brain, you allow those pieces to integrate. And all of a sudden the limbic system is being modulated 
by the by the prefrontal cortex here who's saying, okay, maybe maybe I'm more focused now. Maybe I can pay attention to what's going on here. So physical movement is the easiest way to get from blue or yellow into green. Active listening is probably the only five-star recommendation I can give you for an intervention in disasters. This is the thing that's very, very challenging for people to um, adopt if it's not a, a communication process that you've used or are familiar with. There are a lot of wonderful resources on active listening out there on the internet, but I will suggest this. Typically, the way we talk to people is in a problem-solving mode. You tell me what the issue is, I help you fix it. Active listening is much more effective than problem solving in a disaster for two reasons. It increases connection. Active listening increases connection between the speaker and the listener and connection is part of resilience. That's number one. Number two is that active listening allows the speaker to process what they've been going through and problem solving tends to, well, number one, you can't do it in COVID because the problems are so overwhelming that when you try to solve a problem for someone for the most part, they may feel put off by that or they may feel like they're not being heard. So active listening bridges that gap by allowing the speaker to really express and process what they have gone through, even if you're not fixing or solving anything for them. So th these are the process, this is steps in the process and it's just open-ended questions. It is not a junior woodchuck therapy session, right? You can do active listening in five minutes or 10 minutes. And even if you don't know what to say, a good response in active listening is just, you know, I don't know what to tell you or to say, but I'm really glad that you just told me what you're going through right now. And asking those who, what, where, when, why questions. Um, if you personally are experiencing burnout or compassion fatigue to the extent that you don't think you can do this, then don't, it's okay. But whenever you have the capacity for it, it is a wonderful tool to help increase connection. Family communication, just a few things I want to point out here. Um, youth and children, do not communicate on adult timetables. And so it's really helpful to make sure that the door is open for whenever they are willing and able to communicate with you. And, and teenagers, I work with teenagers in my private practice and they'll, they'll surprise you, right? They'll just talk at the most random times um, and it's midnight or it's in the car, um, but there's a couple different things going on with that. So they don't communicate on our schedules or when we want them to. And really being aware of making sure that window isn't closed to them so that when they are able to communicate, you're there to listen. For older kids, um, ask about what they want. Um, don't assume that you understand what their, their goals may be for their school year or what their hopes and dreams may be. Really inquire about those things. And if they don't answer, that's okay. But part of the communication strategy is just making sure that they know that you're interested. And that has to be a genuine interest that you're showing. Um, with adults, uh, when you're talking back and forth, Make sure to take a break if things get too heated. You're not gonna get to the problem solving place where you can figure out what to do if people are really, really worked up about something. Um, and, and pay attention to your own thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, right? It's hard enough to control our own. So we really run into trouble when we try to control other people's. That doesn't, that doesn't usually go well. So when we're communicating, right, stick to your thoughts, your feelings, your behaviors, and try not to make assumptions, right? And try to engage in active listening as much as possible. Okay, I'm gonna share with you a few tips about anxiety and school refusal. Um, this is, um, I spoke with a client yesterday who had a kiddo who, who went through this. Um, there are a few bottom lines. Number one is that psychology knows a lot about how to manage anxiety. And there are a few key takeaway points. One is, is that anxiety isn't something that happens to us from the outside, like the weather, like rain falling on us. It's something that our body creates on the inside. And as a result of that, one of the first pieces of information that is helpful to share with a student or with a youth is that they can learn, they can teach their body that they're in charge of it. And learning sort of how to be the boss of the anxiety really is empowering. Everybody has this capability. So in order to become the boss is first recognizing that that's possible. And then the second step, and this is the one that's usually more uncomfortable for folks, is that um, reinforcing the fear by avoiding the thing that makes you anxious really, really does make it worse. It's very reinforcing. So we need to go towards the thing that we're worried about, but we can do it in a very, very safe and a very, very gentle way. That's the bottom line with this slide. So other tips for school refusal. Um, try to understand the source of the fear without listening in a judgmental way. Um, work 
through them an example of a time when they knew they were afraid of something before and they were able to conquer that fear. And the bicycle riding one is just an example of that, right? Um, remember how scared you were to take off your training wheels or even to try it. And now look at you cruising around um, or anything that's a similar example. There are lots of developmental milestones that you can use as an example of something someone was afraid of and now they're not. And the way they got there was to gently and slowly work towards that. If you're able to identify what the source is, oftentimes you can break it down, right? Then something becomes a challenge rather than a threat. Um, let's see, I want to figure out what to highlight on here. Um, it's okay to limit the number of times that children reach out for contact, either to you as a parent, if that's who I'm speaking with, or just as a sort of a management technique. Um, constantly calling and checking in actually tends to reinforce anxiety. And it, and it tends to prevent the, the student um, or the youth from learning that they have the capability psychologically and internally to learn how to manage some of their, some of their discomfort. So it's okay to set limits around that for sure. Um, it's very important on a psychological level not to positively reinforce children for staying at home from school. I had a client that I worked with several years ago now, and when she would refuse to go to school, her mom would take her shopping or to Costco or something. And she, mom, the mom didn't realize that that was positive reinforcement for avoiding school because shopping is more fun than going to school. Um, and that needs to not happen. So it needs, you got to be careful about making sure that those staying at home times aren't, aren't positively reinforced. But you can positively reinforce bravery, like trying something and working on that fear. Okay, um, this is just a tip for active management. This is an example for how to gently and slowly approach um, of, you know, the avoidance of school, drive there, walk around, visit an empty classroom if you're allowed to do so. There are differences with COVID in terms of how this approach might be possible in different parts of the country, um, but, it, but the successive steps in this process are recommended. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna let that sit with the slides that you'll have a look at later. Okay. I'm gonna now briefly share with you a model for de-escalation. And this is one that I, I like acronyms. So I create acronym models to help me remember things. Um, and I'm just gonna move through the four elements that are important to remember when you're trying to stay calm or to help other people de-escalate from their anger. Cause there is a lot of anger happening right now. Okay, the first one, and for me, this is the hardest is to stay calm yourself, to modulate your tone and your rate of speech Watch your nonverbal messages, making sure you're not, if you're even on Zoom, right, sitting like this, but if you're in person, keep your hands out of your pockets, and keep your, your body posture open. It's really important to pay attention to those small nuances in how our messaging is expressed to people. And with masks on, those nonverbal messages are even that much more important than they might otherwise be when we're meeting in person. So staying calm, not recognizing that, you know, educators and healthcare workers tend to be sort of easy targets for people who are distressed and upset and staying calm yourself. I think for me, I said, it's one of the hardest ones to do, but it's essential to this process of de-escalation. The second one is being aware of your physical surroundings. Be aware of potential exits and help and resources and do not position yourself between an angry person and the exit. Ideally, both parties will have equal access to the door. If that can't be arranged, you wanna make sure the angry person doesn't have to go through you to get out physically of a space. This is a tricky one psychologically. Anger is very culturally accepted in the United States. It's sort of a norm. And it's a very, very easy emotion for people to access neurologically. It's just an easier one to feel. It's an easier one to express. Um, anger tends to be outwardly expressed, right? The more difficult emotions are sadness and fear. Those tend to be harder for us. They tend to be more uncomfortable and they tend to be more internal. When you use active listening, you usually can identify something underneath the anger that someone is afraid of. For example, uh, when it comes to the pandemic, there are a lot of fears around um, what I get to be responsible for versus what someone else is telling me to do, right? Personal sense of, of power and empowerment and control and a lot of those fears are being expressed as anger in all variety of ways when it comes to our school decisions, our, our decisions around our kids and our safety. And so the anger is the easy thing, right? It's not, not easy to deal with, but underneath it is fear usually. And if you can listen and use that active listening process to address the fear underneath, it tends to completely take away, not completely, but in large part take away the anger that someone is expressing in that moment. And, and the key to that is active listening. 
the last thing here is to engage, right? So engage with the angry person, but also to engage support for yourself. So if you, you know, get yelled at a lot during your day, and some of you very, very well may, depending on your job role, um, don't keep it to yourself, right? Don't post about it on social media, but but talk to a loved one or, or a colleague or a friend or a family member. Don't keep that to yourself. Part of de-escalation is engaging support and resources for yourself to work through that. Okay, just a few more. I know I'm, I have a couple minutes left. Um, it's important to consider individual protective factors for, for children and adults alike. All of these things on this list are things that people may, may gloss over as not being as important or you don't think about it and you're not aware of it, but they all really, really can contribute to our sense of resilience. Family protective factors also are good to take note of and inventory and help, help students and parents do the same thing. Recognize that there are lots of ways that they can express those protective factors on a day-to-day -day basis, even when people are low energy. Um, these are the three active coping techniques that I get asked about the most. And here's what I want to sum up for you. Anxiety is best managed um, in the moment using sensory intervention. The part of the brain that is responsible for sensory processing, sight, touch, taste, smell, and sound, is the part of the brain that is much bigger, stronger, and more powerful than where anxiety is processed. The frozen orange. Um, if you put an orange in your freezer and you feel anxious, right, you can just grab that orange and work on manipulating it or peeling it. And the smell usually is nice for people, but also holding a cold object in your hands when we have so many nerve endings in our fingers really short circuits your, your attention and makes you focus on that thing. You can also dip your hands in a bowl full of ice water for about 20 seconds and it has the same effect. A hot or a cold shower, listening to a favorite song, putting on some fuzzy slippers or something really warm and cozy. Anything that's sensory, that's immediately attention getting for your brain, it's gonna help divert you from anxiety. With exhaustion, um, the one recommendation here that I will make is to not pick up your phone in the middle of the night. If your brain wakes you up at three o'clock in the morning, have a pad of paper and a pencil. So you can write down whatever it is that woke you up, like something to do later, right? or something to follow up on, and then try to go back to sleep without picking up a device because that is much more neurologically stimulating. With depression, consider just behavioral activation. And that is one small step that's gonna get you in the direction that you wanna go or to encourage a student. One student that my colleague worked with was very severely depressed and the behavioral activation choice he made was to walk down a different hallway to his classes. That might seem like nothing, but it was a small change that led to different light and it led to different faces and it led to a different experience that was able to, to sort of move his depression in a different direction. Okay, so these are the ingredients of resilience that I mentioned earlier. Um, they're all important. I will just summarize here by saying that adaptability is the hardest one for people and it's the one that's the most important, obviously, right? It's always that way. Um, adaptability is like the kale and the resilience smoothie. It's the one we need to have because it's really good for us. I, I'm not a fan of kale, maybe some of you are, <laughs> but maybe that's a bad example. Um, but we wanna just consider all of the opportunities we have to adapt to things in a positive and in a negative way. So not just adapting to bad stuff when it happens, but adapting our, our ideas of fun, adapting our off time, adapting our schedules and the way we consider our weekends, all of it, right? Ad adaptability is probably the most important feature of resilience. And hope is what you get when you practice adaptability. Hope is the byproduct of being adaptable because you're able to shift your thinking from threat to challenge. When something is a threat, you can only hide, fight, or run. When something is a challenge, you can pick it apart, break it down and overcome. And hope is what you get when you practice doing that. So all three of the, all, sorry, all four of these ingredients are important, but um, adaptability, I think, is remains the most important. I think that's it. Yeah. Other things to keep in mind, just pay attention to yourself, right? Figure out what works for you. I had somebody tell me on Monday that if they get told to journal one more time, their head's going to explode. So don't journal if that doesn't work for you. Find something that works for you. Make a list of things that are go-to options for you. Make a list of resources that you respond to. Um, think about what you may, you're worried about facing or what you may face and try to pre-plan because sometimes that planning process is just really helpful for empowerment. So you're not surprised by things and reward yourself by doing some things that you enjoy for sure. 
I think that's it for me. The last slide is a resource slide, yeah. Um, the, the, you have a link to the toolbox in the chat and on the slides. Um, I'm, I'm thankful to have gotten this chance to talk to you. I'm sorry I went a minute or two over and I'm sorry I can't stay. <laughs> We completely understand. We release you. We um, show great appreciation to the information you shared. I, for one, am totally glad we're recording this because I feel like I need I need to go back and listen to all um, of the wonderful um, information that you shared. Uh, so at this point, we want to say thank you. I see if you don't see the chat, you're being offered um, lots of gratitude um, from our participants. So that is always appreciated. So, um, so go be mom and thank you thank for you being on with us. <laughs> Bye -bye. And at this point, I'm going to, um, ask that, uh, Corbett come on and talk to us about a mindful state. Thanks Corbett. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself and then, uh, share about a mindful state. Yeah. And, and I'm still like, I think everyone on this call, uh, just completely amazed with, um, the presentation. Um, let me, I got a little bit of an echo uh, there. Um, and uh, I couldn't decide whether I'm like, I, I would love to just listen to Kira on a podcast. Um, if she was taking new clients. She has one, um, <laughs> so I can, we can link you to the podcast. Actually. Okay. We, yeah. Please put the podcast in the chat or email me uh, later. Cause that, that's a lot of really great information that uh, just, just really, really impactful. Um, and I and I learned a lot, um, and 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 so it, some of the things that that um, Kira mentioned, I think, reinforced um, what we were thinking and experiencing um, with uh, and trying to accomplish with the Mindful State campaign. And I'll I'll back up and share a little bit about myself. I'm Corbett Mosley. I'm a um, Tacoma resident. I have three boys that are now 18, 17, and 15. Um, and uh, I'm also one of the co-leads um, or organizers for the Black Parent Alliance in Pierce County. And um, that, that represents a, parents from a number of school districts in the Pierce County area. And so to, just to kind of back up on the story a little bit, um, when COVID first hit, uh, we were really focused. We were a newly formed group. We were really focused on academics. We wanted supports for our kids. Um, we wanted to um, help, uh, you know, uh, students that were excelling um, and had a lot further to go, um, helping them succeed to, um, to go even further. Um, for folks that, for our kids that needed um, certain interventions or supports, we wanted to figure out what we could do to support their academic achievement. Um, thinking about all of those kinds of things on the academic um, uh, front and in uh, and, and helping our kids be successful. Well, um, when COVID hit, um, everything uh, changed and we did have a plan for um, how we would move forward for the year, but it was really clear. Um, and we heard from a number of parents, I think we have about 500 um, uh, members on our Facebook group, um, that mental health and, and wellness and the social and emotional kind of experience that our, that our kids were going through was the most important thing at the beginning of COVID. And so we ended up shifting strategies um, in, in terms of what we focused on. We, we, we weren't focused on homework. We weren't focused on trying to do any of that. We were focused on how our kids felt. Um, and we had a, a, a member um, in the group uh, Lao Kwazim that was also on the governor's um, social supports task force um, that was designed to support um, the other kinds of things that communities might need um, through COVID, whether it be housing or um, other kinds of um, uh, supports and mental health. Uh, he, he was able to bring that message back to the social supports group. Um, we had a number of um, parents that were getting together, um, you know, for about three or four months. Um, we just had therapists come to our sessions and to talk about um, not things that were diagnosed illnesses, but how do we support things around anxiety and stress and social isolation and um, those kinds of things that we were uh, we were kind of watching our kids go through um, when when things were shut down. Um, and it was really, really empower, powerful for us because it was the first time we had had some of these really honest conversations around what we were going through as parents, what our kids were going through. Um, 
and so naturally, I, I, I uh, you know, fast forward, and um, that conversation was was t- taken to the governor's task force. Um, different uh, community members and other um, organizations said the same thing that it was important to their communities as well, and they launched a um, mindful state um, campaign. So. Uh, I was brought on um, early on in the campaign to help with some of the community engagement. And, um, uh, and, and really what we were trying to do is not push out one particular message as a solution or um, trying to problem solve, but really what we're trying to do with this campaign is to normalize communities to talk about their feelings and emotions and to do it in an authentic way and leverage their voices so that they could we could share that out with other folks, um, those that were willing to um, to do that, that felt comfortable in doing it. Um, and we interviewed um, well over 250 people from across the state um, in different communities, really focusing on communities of color. Um, and in in one hour um, interviews, um, 45 minutes to an uh, about an hour about different questions around what would the world look like if, if people were open about their feelings and emotions? Um, how were they dealing with the pandemic? Um, what, uh, what kinds of things did they see in their communities and that would, uh, that, that they would want to see more of that, that it would identify, you know, that's where we got it right. That's how we support each other. And that's something that we should share with one another and other communities about how we can support each other. So it was really, really powerful work. Um, we had a team of, of consultants um, and people that were doing uh, engagement um, in, in different groups and different communities throughout the state. We also leverage um, a certain strategy w- with social media influencers. And so we tried to leverage folks that were small influencers that had maybe a, a you know, a, a range of 10,000 followers on Instagram to 75 or 80,000 followers on Instagram, people that were influencers that were in the state of Washington. So we went out, we did grassroots kind of engagement, we leveraged influencers, we talked to nonprofit organizations and um, different community associations to try to get more buy in, more people talking about this experience that's been a shared experience for all of us um, around. Um, Around how uh, around how we're doing um, through this this process, and it's and it's still going on. So we're uh, if you haven't checked out the the website, um, a mindful state, it's a pretty powerful um, collection of stories. And I think we've only released at this point about twenty five percent of those videos. Um, and there's there's a lot of really good stories that are really connecting with people within community um, that I think are are helpful. Um, let me show you a quick video um, that should just take a, a, about one minute uh, just to kind of um, share um, a little bit about what we what we heard. You have to let people tell their stories. They have to talk it through and they need people that they can lean on, people that will listen, and then the healing can start. We've all been through this pandemic. We've all had this shared experience. Why isn't mental health a shared experience too? So um, the the idea of this as a people generated campaign um, was really fascinating to a lot of us. Um, never had we've never worked on anything like this before. I've never worked on anything like this before. Um, but it was so different to not have a message or one like it, we can think of it more as an anthem. Um, uh, but for 250 plus people throughout the state to kind of tell their story and for us to kind of you know, bring that down to a, a, a three or four minute uh, clip um, and share it out with the, with their community. We've now uh, on social media um, probably had um, well over two million um, folks that have engaged with the content online. Um, there were buses, uh, you know, uh, buses were wrapped, bus stations, billboards, commercial video, radio ads. Um, 
uh, and, and, and bringing people back to um, some of the fuller stories on the website um, where they can also say, see themselves kind of reflected in those individuals to say, you know, this person resonates with me. Um, I, I'm struggling with anxiety too, or um, their story is similar to mine. And you can look up on the right-hand side about the kinds of resources that um, uh, that are available that kind of match up with some of those. Um, and so it's it's both kind of normalizing the conversation around mental health and, and wellness, um, getting people comfortable to talking about it, um, identifying with those folks um, and pointing people to resources that exist um, throughout the state. Um, but I, I, I really think that before you even get to the resources, um, there's certain communities that just have not felt comfortable or have not openly talked about it, particularly in the African-American community and several other communities that we engage with uh, just, you know, uh, shied away from talking around about mental health. And this really opened the doors um, to those conversations with the Black Parent Alliance, with the Pierce County Black Collective. Um, we had a lots of kind of community conversations and engagement, um, and it's just been a wonderful experience to be a part of. And I, um, um, we, we, we've gotten a lot of stories about how, um, how, it's, how it's helped folks um, and, and also some ways that the systems that we currently have need to be improved to really be able to meet the needs of where folks are at. So um, I think those are my three uh, slides and the, the, maybe that helps us keep on time. Um, Kelsey, is that, um, maybe I'll just kind of reserve my time for questions and kind of go from there. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, okay. Thank you, Corbett, so much for sharing um, this work. Uh, we have um, appreciated having the opportunity to partner um, with a mindful state and, and think about how we can engage um, schools um, and, and districts in this work. And I asked in the chat, just curious if folks have seen any of the billboards or um, bus ads. Uh, every once in a while I see one um, and get really excited. And as Corbett mentioned, the stories are powerful. Uh, it's helpful to you know listen to folks talk about the experience that they've had and, and relate to those experiences. Um, so thank you for the work that you and your team have done on, on a mindful state and I hope you'll, you can stick around a little bit longer if folks have questions um, for Corbett, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. And uh, at this point, I will um, introduce our next speaker, Catrice Tybet chapin who is a school psychologist in Vancouver Public Schools and um, has been uh, working on um, just an amazing uh, wellness series for BIPOC school mental health providers with Dr. Sabine Thomas. And at this point, I'm gonna hand it off to her so she can tell you about the series and the products and, and how you can access um, the information and what's coming up next. Thanks Catrice for being here. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to the MHTTC entire team for um, just giving Dr. Thomas and I the opportunity to discuss what's happening with the BIPOC school-based mental health community in a safe way. Um, I also want to echo all of our viewers um, with Dr. Kira's presentation. I'm really excited to see that podcast. And some of the things that stood to, for me um, had to do with facing fear and active listening. I was able to be a part of the Mindful State campaign, and I faced my fear of talking about some of the stressors or my experiences with mental health during the pandemic. Um, and being, a, I have four girls, um, 20, 21, and 22 years of age, and a 17-month-old. So I had a baby right in the midst of the pandemic, and oh my goodness, just to be able to talk about what I was experiencing and going through was beautiful. So Anchored in Our Roots is a pretty cool collaboration between Dr. Thomas, who is a um, naturopathic doctor, and myself, who's a, a school psychologist supporting Vancouver Public Schools. Um, I'm at the high school level, but I've worked in early childhood for like 24 years. So three years at high school right now, and I am I'm learning a ton about just mental health at a different level. But what I'm also learning about is how do school-based mental health providers who are BIPOC, how do we interface, interact, and engage within our community? 
What do we need more of? And are we safe in our communities, our school communities to talk about what we need more of? So anchored in our roots is, the framework is, I can just go to that. It's a self-guided and self-paced resource. So there's two videos. Video one is about, it's a conversation between Dr. Thomas and I. And the first conversation has to do with the theories that we see that bubble up in mental health in the school, which is you know, compassion fatigue, um, vicarious trauma, um, positionality, intersectionalities. We go through those theories, we go through those definitions, and we try to decolonize some of those concepts as it relates to Black, Indigenous, people of color who are mental health providers in the school setting. We thought that was really good to, to do. That's like video one. Video two then goes to the roots of self-care. So once we know about vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue, racial battle fatigue, we learn about um, post-traumatic slave syndrome, concepts that deal specifically the BIPOC communities, how do we then process those, com those, those concepts as people of color? And so video two takes us to a holistic self-care guide on how to get to our ancestral roots of self-care and healing. There's two workbooks that are companions to the videos and we have audio segment stats to support the framework of the videos and the workbooks. So the vision was how can we as BIPOC mental health providers feel safe with talking about some of the things that we experience in our school community. For example, I'm the only African-American school psychologist in my school district. And I'm often asked within my school setting or within the district to do some cultural bridging, meaning that I'm asked to help teachers or non-BIPOC educators, help them understand some of the cultural nuances of families. And I love doing that. I love talking about culture. I love talking about families. I love talking about the Black community. However, I also love being in my role as a school psychologist and taking, and when I'm asked to cultural bridge and be that school psychologist, sometimes I don't feel safe. I don't feel that I can do both um, effectively. And that puts me in a really odd situation um, where can I truly advocate for this family without being biased? Am I really adhering to my code of ethics if I'm interjecting some of my personal experiences in order to culturally bridge for someone else? And so this project allowed for us to have a safe space to talk about that. Um, and for BIPOC providers, I'm hoping that they can understand and they feel safe about sharing this with their non-BIPOC colleagues. So um, one of the things that we also wanted to do is, uh, Dr. Thomas and I, is to give each other permission to take time, self-reflect, learn, and heal. Um, just regardless of your race and ethnicity, your language, being a mental health provider, it's it can be a stressful um, job. And we often, <laughs> Um, put forth front the needs of our, our community that we're serving. And so this project gave not only myself time to slow down and reflect, but it gave me time to heal um, from some of the experiences that I have been through during the pandemic, but also just being um, an African-American Counsel, like school psychologist. So it gave me time to reflect and, and that time is like a gift. Um, and then the, the project also helps us get back to the roots of ancestral self-care. And so Dr. Thomas in the second video, she goes into some of the ancestral healing practices that were um, once a beautiful flourishing piece of the identity of the BIPOC community, but over time got decolonized and the colonization of self-care came to the forefront and our ancestral roots came to the back. So we revisit those ancestral roots of healing, such as 
having taking our first shoes and filling the bare grounds, such as the different incense and different fragrances, different foods of our ancestors in our culture, um, embodying the soul food again that um, helped us and healed us. So the next couple of slides just have to do with some quotes that reflect kind of the message of anchored in our roots. I love this quote by James Baldwin, the paradox of education is precisely this, that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he is being educated. And so we're hoping that with anchored in our roots, you're gonna get a chance to reacquaint yourself with your ancestral roots. Um, if you're not part of the BIPOC community, you're gonna get a chance to learn a little bit about the experiences of BIPOC mental health providers. And then hopefully your truth might change a little bit to be able to advocate and create allyships with your BIPOC colleagues um, in order to just grow our community and be more understanding of our community. Radical love, I absolutely love this. Um, every time someone loves themselves better, builds their self-awareness, understands their patterns, improves their ability to communicate and expands their compassion for others, the future of humanity grows brighter. Your healing impacts the world by bringing in new peace. So in Anchored in Our Roots, we're hoping that as you are self-reflecting, as you're taking time to heal, as you're connecting with your ancestral roots, you're bringing you peace to yourself and to those around you. And then compassionate healing. Of everything I've learned so much, I've learned to be compassionate and gentle with myself. I've learned to experience grace and humility. And then I've learned that the most important thing is for us to be kind to each other and to see the human in, in each other. So after you've reviewed all the content of Anchored in Our Roots, what we like to have is a more of an opportunity for BIPOC mental health providers to have like a virtual community where we can safely discuss things that are happening within our school systems, our communities, and then find some opportunities to do some self-healing, um, self-reflection at each of those community uh, sessions that we could have. So we do have an interest survey that we'd love for you guys all to fill out. And right now it is limited to region 10, um, but please feel free after you've reviewed all the content, we do have an email account. Um, so if you email us with any questions, we can um, get back to you and hopefully um, start a communication and a community um, with some new folks. So that's all I have for now. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Catrice. Um, thank you for, for speaking your truth and for taking uh, the time, you and Dr. Thomas, this summer to create such um, amazing material. Um, and I would just welcome every everyone. Um, we are um, centering the voices of our BIPOC school mental health staff in this. Um, but um, as a white ally and those of us supporting um, uh, you know, our colleagues, I encourage all of you to engage with this material and, and hope that um, we can continue these conversations and continue this work and look forward to uh, these BIPOC school mental health virtual spaces um, that uh, Catrice and Dr. Thomas will be offering the school year. So I'm going to um, shift gears just a little. Uh, you're actually going to hear from me a bit about a few resources that we have created at our Northwest Mental Health um, Technology Transfer Center's um, school mental health team uh, over the summer. Um, we recognize that there are so many resources and that can just sometimes be paralyzing to even know where to start. Um, so we offer ourselves as um, just folks you can reach out to to say, we're looking for something like this, or have you done something like this? Or do you know where this might exist? Um, we always welcome you to visit our um, Northwest 
uh, school mental health website for that information. And actually any of the information that you're hearing today will all be on there. A couple of things that I am going to highlight just really quickly. Um, some of you have been a part of the interconnected systems framework, which is installing school mental health within a multi-tiered system of support um, framework. And um, we've been doing series in partnership with the Pacific Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center over the last several years, um, in partnership with um, Susan Barrett from the Center on TDIS, who's one of the um, authors of this work. Um, and uh, and uh, shout out to Susan, who I think at one point was on the webinar. So it was great to see her on here. I hope she's still with us. But what we did is recognizing that this material was pretty spread out is we pulled it all together into one document. So whether you are just beginning and need some foundational material and some fact sheets to share with people, um, or you're ready to dive into um, the learning sessions, the modules that we did last year, um, maybe you need some assessment tools, uh, some key readings. We've got folks doing book studies on the Interconnected Systems Framework Implementation Guide. Um, or just some implementation examples. Uh, this is a document that you can go to without having to hunt and peck all over the internet for these things um, to access those resources. The other document that I wanted to highlight is um, uh, a document that was put together uh, with several, um, several folks, our Smart Center folks, Seattle Children's folks, um, center on PBIS, and it's this behavioral health impacts during and after COVID-19. And, uh, you know, Dr. Mosseth really has just been um, such an amazing leader for us. Uh, her and her behavioral health strike team has helped us understand um, the, uh, the, the, um, the process that folks go through in a pandemic and um, the behavioral health uh, responses uh, according to each of those um, phases that she talked about. So we use that as an opportunity to talk about in this, um, in this guide sort of what to expect as kids are, are coming back, kids and, and staff are coming back. Um, and then some recommendations. So a list of um, hopefully easy to kind of follow bulleted recommendations at the staff and building level, um, and then some recommendations at the district level. And then the final um, page is, is a resource page. This summer, we did um, another partnership activity with our um, colleagues at the Pacific Southwest MHTTC and invited survivors of um, COVID-19 to talk about the impl implications um, for school mental health systems. And so this was um, just a really rich conversation with those survivors and things for us to think about as we are coming back and, um, and are supporting folks who have um, experienced surviving COVID-19. We had a graphic artist join us. So she did this really remarkable um, uh, piece uh, that reflects sort of those um, key points in the webinar. So hope that you can visit that and, and listen to that webinar. Today's also World Suicide Prevention Day. September is uh, Suicide Prevention Month. And we wanna share with you um, an event that we held um, last year with our uh, friends and colleagues at Forefront Suicide Prevention. Um, one of our most um, highly viewed uh, presentations on our YouTube channel um, was this great presentation um, by Jennifer Stuber and Chris DeCou um, talking through the Learn Saves Lives approach and, um, and having a, an open Q&A session. So welcome you to um, check that out as well. Uh, again, a fairly newer resource that's just coming out. And this was a project that was done um, with our colleagues um, at the Smart Center and uh, the Chad's Legacy Project where they reviewed mental health literacy programs against mental health literacy um, components and implementation features and the Washington State Learning Standards. Um, it also includes a um, implementation guide as well. So with that, I'm gonna invite um, our newest uh, member of our uh, school mental health team at the Northwest MHTTC to come on and um, tell us a little bit about Classroom Wise. Hi, Ryan. 
Hi, uh, Rianne Silva. Uh, as Kelsey just shared, I'm the newest member at the MHTTC, and I have the pleasure of sharing Classroom Rise with you. So Classroom Wise was developed uh, by the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center in partnership with the National Center for School Mental Health. The goal of it is really to provide evidence-based strategies and skills that will engage and support your students with mental health concerns in the classroom. So there's three different ways that you can engage with Classroom Wise. The first is the comprehensive online course. There's also um, a video library, and then a resource collection. And both of those are aligned to the course content. So Classroom Wise de was designed to eliminate all of the barriers that we experience um, in districts for accessing high quality mental health trainings. It's completely free, it's interactive, uh, it's self-paced and on demand. And then each module is designed in short, interactive, uh, manageable chunks. Uh, you can engage with it uh, at the individual level or as a team. So there's a total of six modules and you can access them individually, but they also build off of one another um, and are connected. So the video library is packed with over, I think it's over 50 videos. Um, they are uh, aligned to the modules and the resource collection the same way is aligned to the modules, but it's packed with evidence-based resources pulled from across the field um, from districts. Some of them were developed by MHTTC. Um, great, great resource bank. All right. So I'm going to introduce you to not all of the modules, but just kind of give you an introduction. The first three are focused on promoting promoting mental health and well-being for our students. So the first one is about classroom foundations, and it would be helpful any year, but especially this year. Um, you'll see here that they're not just designed for elementary, but also appropriate for the secondary level. And the resource collection here, it focuses on our uh, trauma-sensitive practices, equitable classrooms, inclusive language, all aligned to the content and the modules. The second module, it aims to support educator, educators in teaching uh, mental health literacy and reducing stigma. Um, it provides resources for circles, um, inclusive language, and helping students talk about it in the classroom and with each other. All right, the last or the third module is about fostering social and emotional learning in the classroom. It's aligned to the CASEL framework. Again, it's appropriate for all K-12 grades. Um, tons of resources for, the, for implementing with adults across the school and in your classroom. So modules four through, four through six are about understanding and supporting uh, students experiencing diversity and distress. Um, you'll learn about how to recognize that distress, uh, the impacts of trauma, how to integrate trauma sensitive practices and how to link students to support um, within the school and outside of the school. So I know that I just shared like hours of content with you in just a few moments, but you'll get all of the links um, afterwards in your resource list. And we hope that you'll access them, share them with your colleagues and um, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Rayanne, for jumping in and, and sharing Classroom Wise. Um, you know, I think one of the greatest part is um, about all the resources that have been shared today is that none of them cost anything. Um, so just a real opportunity to access some high quality materials. So I think what I'll do is I'll ask um, our remaining, our panelists who are remaining to come back on camera. And what we'd like to do um, in the chat as, as we're coming back on, I'm not seeing any questions in the Q&A. So here's what we're going to do. We want to hear from you. What, what do you need in terms of school mental health and MTSS? Um, topics, uh, formats. Um, you know, what, what things are most helpful for you? Toolkits, webinars, websites, 
short bite-sized resource pages. Um, really tell us, tell us what you need. And, and you can tell us that in the chat box. Uh, we have a question in our evaluation that asks us. And if you think, um, if you think about something later, you're also welcome to email us as well. Corbett, yeah. Patrice, <clears throat> any additional thoughts or information you want to share while we've still got time with folks? Sure. Yeah, I, I actually have a, um, I'm still learning. And I, I think the thing that I have learned over the past year on, on working with it is that you don't need to be um, an expert to support others, that you don't need to be um, you don't need to be a professional to um, to just figure out like what we can do as a community to kind of normalize the conversation and break down some of the stigmas um, with it. And, it. and I was really surprised at how many people were really um, like were really struggling with some stuff that they just weren't talking about. Um, and I was also surprised that there was a lot that the, this huge knowledge base of support and mm -hmm. and, and folks to talk to um, existed. Um, and today, I mean, just listening to um, Catrice and her work, um, listening to uh, the, the other uh, 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 presenter, um, uh, I mean, there's a lot to learn. And um, so my boys are 18, 17 and 15. Um, and I don't think I'm, it's, too, it's not too late. <laughs> so um, uh, there, there's different, you know, so I, I'm just enjoying kind of the, the, the process to continue to learn with others, um, to continue to learn with my communities that I'm engaged with and, uh, and, and seeing the value. So I, I appreciate the time, Kelsey and, and Catrice and, and um, uh, your whole team um, um, to have these kinds of conversations. Thank you, Corbett. There are a couple questions I want to get to. Um, we have a question about often using culture as a way of connecting with patients of color, but current world events have made it harder to connect with them or get them to continue receiving services. Are there any thoughts? I would just say, I think amongst a lot of the just BIPOC community is building that rapport with the, the students and the families that we're serving. And that rapport building, I think is the tricky piece because it's establishing trust. And so how do you establish trust with a community that's often marginalized, disfranchised, um, oppressed? Well, I think it's about opening the doors for conversations, right? So at our school district, um, we had a student virtual voice forum where our high school students were able to um, just have a virtual platform to share what was bothering them, what was concerning them, the policing that was happening. So we just provided a variety of different medias for our students to feel empowered to talk about things. We also like attended, I mean, I've been attending the parent nights so that um, parents can get to know me and my community um, and I can get to know them in their community and we can break bread and talk about what's emerging topics are there. So I think it's like creating a thinking outside of the box on how do we um, engage with families and students in um, non-traditional ways. Um, that's been really helpful. I would just <clears throat> add, I think it's um, I think it's really about investing into the connections and the engagement um, with communities of, of color, like spending the time, I think that is saying the same thing that Catrice is saying, um, but not you can come join our group or you can come participate in our program, but what kinds of engagement activities and what kinds of things are different communities of color doing that you can participate in and um, as a way to kind of build, build trust and relationship and engagement. Um, and I think that communities are doing some really powerful stuff. Um, and so there's an opportunity for, to, to leverage expertise that folks have in, in helping support those initiatives. Thank you both. Um, there's another question. Uh, we need access to mental health therapists in schools. Can you share strategies and considerations for school districts who want to hire versus contracting with agencies? Patrice, I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about, about that and your experience. My goodness. Well, I know there's a lot of initiatives like in Washington State on um, hiring contract providers versus hiring staff. And a lot of it comes down to funding. 
right? How we are allocating funding. Um, I don't know a breath more, like a lot more about that. I just know that funding is always at the top. And then also the roles of like school psychologists and school counselors. We're really trying in Washington state to advocate for our role to be more comprehensive. We do have the training to be able to provide some direct support and instruction. However, we're often, as school psychologists, we're often kind of narrow in the sense um, of being doing psychometrics. So testing, assessing, um, diagnosing. And so it's really up to us to feel comfortable enough to do those counseling groups to provide that additional supports that we should be doing as comprehensive psychologists. Um, so it's up, up to us to advocate for that. So it's, it's just tricky because a lot of it's just funding and how our school districts perceive our roles to be as school counselors and psychologists. Yeah, I, I would also offer up um, the work that we're doing around the interconnected systems framework. Um, a lot of that really helps us think about um, kind of what Catrice is talking about in terms of uh, the changing role of the school clinician um, and, and, and our school um, mental health providers working to the top of their licenses and being able to do that work that they were trained to do and taking full advantage of those things. Um, but also there you know, are gonna come times when we need the support of our community partners. And I think traditionally we've operated in a very co-located co manner where we hire somebody, they come in you know, to our building for a couple days a week, they see kids and, and they're gone. And, and we really need to rethink that strategy. And I think um, the work that um, Susan Barrett and others have been leading us through um, around the interconnected systems framework and thinking um, about how we integrate uh, those community uh, mental health providers into our teams. Um, so they actually can lend their expertise, um, you know, at, at what we refer to as the tier one or universal level when we're thinking about you know, high rates of, of students with anxiety and depression and, and really leaning on, on, um, on our school base and our community based uh, partners for that, um, that information and support. I don't see any other questions. And um, so I wanna just take this time to wrap up our time together. These things always go way faster than you think they're going to. Um, just again, wanna thank our uh, amazing panelists, um, colleagues and friends who have been participating and, and spending the time um, with us. We encourage you uh, to reach out uh, to us. The uh, QR code that's on the screen takes you directly to our website. Um, and uh, this slide has uh, a list of the resources that we shared, as well as a link to the training and events calendar for the National uh, Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network and the products uh, and resources catalog so that you can access uh, materials and opportunities from, uh, from the uh, MHTTC National Network. Um, so here's a last reminder uh, for how you can reach out um, to Rayanne and I and our team. Want to give um, props to uh, our behind the scenes folks, uh, Jennifer Cohen and Natalie Flores, um, who also uh, help us with uh, the pre production and uh, post production of these events um, and welcome you to reach out to us with the support needs that you have. And we'll be in touch with you soon. Thank you.